Hello and welcome uh, to the Prince New Show, Ask Eela. It will be a new weekly show on the economy. Uh, we have with us uh, Professor Eela Patnayak, a noted economist and a professor at National Institute of Public Finance and Policy. As you know, uh, the Modi government yesterday announced some huge measures when it comes to vaccinating uh, Indians. Uh, it is, uh, the, the government has opened up uh, vaccinations for all people above 18 years of age. They have also announced that private vaccine manufacturers can now sell 50% of their production to state governments as well as to the private sector in the open market. So there have been significant changes on, the, uh, on, the, on that front. On the other hand, as the pandemic has, as the pandemic has spread uh, quite quickly, uh, many states have been forced to impose a lockdown. So what does this mean for economic recovery? We, uh, we'll just uh, ask uh, ma'am on that. And so please do send in your questions. And I'll be happy to field them to ma'am on your behalf. So now I'll just start off uh, asking you, you know, what impact, how do you watch the impact of the uh, yesterday's announcement by the government, the fact that they have opened up vaccine, the whole, uh, in fact, the whole vaccine manufacturing industry. Uh, yeah, I think it's very good, you see, because uh, this means that price controls uh, for the producers go away. I mean, if you try and understand supply, then, you know, your Econ 101 class tells you that uh, supply curve is upward sloping. Right. So if people pay more, then supply is increased. So what it does, I mean, while the government's uh, program of uh, 45 plus and, uh, you know, government procurement uh, by the central government continues. But at the same time, with this increased uh, demand and increased uh, production capacity that will come along with it, the increased supply that will follow, will definitely follow. Uh, and uh, that it is also now possible for people to... Uh, you know, vaccinate uh, younger people. So all adults, 18 plus basically means that all adults can now be uh, vaccinated. And that's very good for the workforce because what we are seeing in the last few days is very, very scary. Many offices have started shutting down. People have started going back home. Uh, curfew, Bombay, Delhi, you know, curfews have started. And this would have been a huge, huge, huge problem for the economy and what it would have meant for GDP looking forward. So it's a very positive uh, step. So as you said, even, you know, now probably uh, big manufacturing companies can actually start, and uh, you know, vaccinating their uh, labor force to ensure that the industry doesn't really have to shut down you know, if, even if there's an outbreak in their particular plant. I think the feeling so far, yes, they can. The feeling so far was that if uh, the most vulnerable uh, don't get the vaccine, then there will be higher deaths. And, you know, so first we need to vaccinate those. Now, of course, that program continues, but we also saw that uh, the new variants, uh, the new mutants of COVID started hitting younger people as well to a huge extent. And the death rates, uh, death rates are again up. So I think this uh, scenario made it very, very important. And, uh, you know, in, our, uh, in my column uh, this week also, I have there focused on allowing foreign vaccines as well. Those foreign means those approved by foreign regulators or the WHO. So like US, UK, Europe and Japan and uh, the WHO. So that uh, is all put together, basically means more supply because we've had a supply issue in the last few days and the... Uh, vaccination came down, the growth rate of, you know, the number numbers came down because of supply issues. So hopefully that can go back up and employers who, you know, wish to pay more, more and buy vaccines and get workers to come back and employees to come back and for work to continue. It's an excellent um, thing that's happening. Right, ma'am. Also, uh, what is your take on the lockdown? Will the economic impact be as worse as what we saw, you know, the, in the corresponding quarter last year? How do you watch it this time around? So I think it will be better than what happened last year because last year uh, everyone was unprepared. So the lockdown measures were very, very stringent. Uh, that's one thing. The second is that companies were unprepared. Nobody really knew what to do. Third is the health system was much more unprepared. We didn't know how to deal with it. And there was no vaccine around. Uh, now, in fact, if you think of the population, then it was a totally, uh, you know, it was total dry wood where uh, we barely had 100 people who were immune. Whereas now, if you combine the numbers who've had COVID, who've 
had the vaccine, then relatively, relatively, there are, you know, people who are more immune, maybe eight to 10% of the population today. So compared to last year, uh, I think it would not be as bad. So we saw, you know, 24% decline in GDP in this quarter last year. I don't think we'll see that. Uh, but, uh, you know, this sort of uncertainty, this long, fit, this fatigue from uh, COVID, uh, it's obviously bad news for the economy. And there have been some kind of downward revisions that have already started, at least for the quarter growth, you know, yeah. a few percentage points, at least on a quarter basis. So that has already started. So as you said, you know, it really will depend on how long the lockdown actually lasts. Uh, also, what is your take on the reverse migration? Uh, we've again seen people queuing up at railway stations and in bus stations. What kind of an impact do you think that will also have? See, again, it causes disruptions. So uh, construction is one industry which, uh, you know, unless, so like for Delhi, unless it's on, unless workers are on site, uh, it doesn't allow them to come to work. And everywhere workers are not on site because that's very hard to do. That was done in the lockdown earlier. And that means that the industry again comes to a stop and people having suffered what they did last time, uh, you know, where they sat for many days in conditions which were very, very difficult. So now you're seeing them go back. And obviously it is disruptive, but the point is that these are not normal times. So, you know, you, you will likely see a disruption because of that as well. Right. I'll now start taking audience questions, ma'am. The first question is from Tejas Jain, who's asking, what effect will this uh, recent wave have of a recent wave of COVID cases and the corresponding lockdown measures will have on uh, microfinance institutions and their operations? So for those who have given their uh, customers additional time to return, again, you know, they're going to be in difficulty. And if they have to pay back from where they have borrowed, then they're, uh, you know, they, they'll find it difficult. So, uh, you know, we really have to see how much, how long and how uh, bad the lockdowns are, how stringent rather the lockdowns are and to what extent they allow economic activity uh, because people's ability to return loans, especially, you know, small loans from microfinance institutions depends on how stringent they are. We are today seeing them in big cities, but let's see what happens all over the country. All right. Ajay Singh is asking, uh, in your opinion, how much will the GDP vary from the RBI's estimation that was stated? So this time, I think the RBI has projected a 10.5% growth versus and around an 8% contraction for 2021. See, RBI was optimistic uh, because I, at the time when the uh, forecast was made, it was assumed that uh, we have, with great difficulty, come back on track. Okay? Uh, it was not, uh, I, you know, not explicitly uh, factored in that we would have such a big wave again. So I think the RBI might, let's, let's see what happens in the next two, three months. Because if, you know, you have to go for more and more stringent lockdowns, then I think the RBI will definitely revise its uh, forecast. It will have to revise it downwards. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, Hitesh uh, Nautial is asking, uh, what are the precautionary measures that the government should implement immediately so that the economy doesn't suffer uh, badly, just like it did the previous year? And any... Okay. And he's complimenting that he really likes this new program. Thank you. Uh, the measures are both in terms of vaccine uh, and safety measures. I mean, I think we've, we're all uh, these days getting aghast when a lot of people, when there are big crowds. Today we are scared. Somehow, you know, after uh, November, December, January, February, when, you know, barely 100 cases in Delhi and you know, things look like, okay, they, uh, we've somehow uh, defeated COVID. When it looked like that, I think we became very, very lax. And when pe public becomes lax, so does the government. So a lot of things that were happening where big crowds were getting together, uh, need, the government needs to put in uh, precautionary safety measures in place and try to enforce them both uh, in terms of, you know, actually... Uh, not necessarily lockdowns because they will be bad for the economy, but certainly stringent uh, safety measures and not allowing crowding in where, uh, you know, it's non-essential. Right. Um, so Haas is asking, 
we always have positive inflation is it bad why some countries in europe have negative inflation so in some inflation is always good why is some inflation good so what does economic theory tell us basically that uh, you know some prices of some goods increase and some goods decrease or rather the relative prices of goods change okay so what your uh, mobile phone cost versus what your uh, vegetables cost a year ago what, or 10 years ago when mobile phones were very expensive was certainly very different. Different. yeah so you know to allow relative prices to change either it can be that they grow at different rates or it can be that some prices go down now usually uh, you know the sort of psychological uh, effect prices going down and along with that obviously wages and profits and incomes going down makes people unhappy so when if prices were to be going down then obviously there would be people who would earn less maybe you know they they take home wage will in nominal terms be lower even if because prices have gone down it could be that actually their wages are uh, the real wages are unchanged but because there is that unhappiness usually it's not a good idea to have prices go down and therefore for allowing a change in relative prices it is important that you have a little bit of inflation so you know not have higher and volatile inflation but say a 2 to 4% inflation is actually considered good okay a related question from anshuman thakur who is asking what are your thoughts on retail inflation hitting 5.5% will it be in the uh, will it be in best in, in the best interest to leave inflation in the higher range now no i uh, you know the government has already uh, kept it at 4 we've had uh, a lot of discussions so yp and i in our previous uh, episodes uh, have had many discussions on this issue that why it is not a good idea to keep pushing up the inflation rate now uh, just to re you know uh, maybe repeat some of the points that we discussed one is that after a, about a 7% inflation or so uh you start seeing growth being hit negatively okay so above 7% inflation typically has a negative impact on growth so you wanted to keep it below 7 now since you are an emerging economy with a poor monetary policy transmission mechanism you don't have a very tight band a 4% inflation means you are typically inflating 2% more than advanced economies right so because they typically have a 2% uh, inflation target most of them so that is the kind and and then your currency is depreciating about roughly 2% if you know in the short term if you have uh, purchasing power parity conditions then you roughly seeing a 2% depreciation with a 2% uh, average medium and so on obviously this is not moment to moment but on average so that is over and above so, you know a, a 4% rate means that you will get a roughly on average 2% depreciation so that's the second reason why you apart from the first one which is that you don't want high inflation because it starts affecting growth the second reason is that if you start having inflation higher than that in developed uh, the the difference is too much then you'll also witness higher depreciation and that brings a lot of instability along with it it's not you know it 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 affects your capital flows it affects so expectations of depreciation change and so on so i think four is was a good target continues to be a good target and i'm glad that we stuck to the four for the uh, target correct right. you uh, we now ask some investment advice uh, deepankar sajwan is asking ma'am how can we save our investments in these difficult times no investment advice no investment <laughs> advice no <laughs> investment advice i'm only trying to help understand what policies are changing why they are changing and the way if the economy is moving i have no investment advice to offer right so uh, dipankar you should actually contact a financial uh, you know a financial planner who will be probably able to help you through the various investment options that are there uh, wish to prasad is asking vaccines for 100 crore indians will be very expensive where will the money come for this or uh, will this affect infra investments or other forward looking actions of the government no i think uh, there's so, so you know the amounts of money that are being spent 
you know what what the government's budget is what something like 17 lakh crore yeah 17 18 lakh crore then there is cent, uh, state government's budgets which now will be spending on the vaccines as well uh, the, these are uh, uh, can easily you know put in a few thousand crores consider the fact that now they are borrowing more and if they were to try and spend it on say something else let, let's say let's this they spend it on uh, schooling What's the point? Children can't go to school. Let's say they spend it on uh, road building. Not much point. You won't get the economic activity. So whenever you think of government spending, try and think of it as a menu, a portfolio of choices. It's not something is expensive or not expensive in the context of what it could be spent on. So I think this can be afforded and it is going to be afforded and affordable. And that's what is happening now. Right. Uh, so Ishan Sagar is asking, so are we going to see another quarter or two of negative growth in India thanks to increased infection and its likely fallouts in the coming weeks? Could happen that if, you know. Even with the low base of last year, ma'am, as in a negative base of last year? Uh, so it may not, uh, yeah, it may not be lower than, a uh, level of GDP may not be lower than what it was last year. But if I look at the whole year, you know, so last quarter was very, very bad. But if I look at the whole year, I think it will pick up compared to last year. But if you talk, talk about levels, are we going to go back to the pre-COVID levels this year? So that to that question, I would say very unlikely. So will so, the GDP be as of March 2020? Will we reach that level is what you're saying, right? That is... Mm -hmm. That's the question that is yeah so it's you know come in, in these uh, in this environment comparing year on year uh, is a bit of a <laughs> <laughs> which will i'm sure obviously be done but <laughs> yes uh, so uh, kartikei divedi is asking what is the likelihood of income support to vulnerable groups in case of further deterioration of the covid situation and if that kind of a space exists uh, exists for policy to deal with the ensuing uh, inflation so, I mean, it's obviously something that rich countries are doing. Um, most uh, rich countries have gone up to giving, uh, have given income support of up to uh, 10 to 20 percent of their GDP. Uh, India has not been able to afford that, particularly because we don't have the ability, like most emerging economies, to borrow and give a lot of income support. So our uh, additional expenditure on uh, these programs have been about 3% of GDP. Uh, ours is emerging economy average has been about 3% of GDP. And uh, India is pretty much, a, you know, with what other emerging economies are doing. It is also, uh, I, think, I think what you also need to think about it about is what are the mechanisms for giving uh, income support. So while you can transfer some money to Jandhan accounts, what you don't have is the kind of payroll uh, you know, transfers that could be done, say, in the US or in Italy, where they had data for every single worker working in every firm, because we have a very large informal sector. So, you know, you can expect some relief, of course, whenever, you know, uh, there are problems, governments give relief. But I don't think it will be of the kind of income support that you have seen in advanced economies. Neither can the country afford it, nor do we have the mechanisms to do it. So the data, how are you going to do those transfer, who are your transfers, who are you going to give money to, those are not there. Right. And I think India is still setting up its migrant database, right? That has been in the works for the last one year. And, you know, that process is still ongoing and we don't have a complete migrant yeah. database. Yeah. As. yeah. So... Um, uh, Porin Zaveri is asking, with all the bond auctions failing and lockdowns incoming, will the RBI allow yields to rise further? So RBI is going to have a very difficult time. RBI is both the debt manager and the inflation targeter. And, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if you're aware of the kind of fights that happened from 2015 onwards. Uh, when uh, the government tried to set up a public debt management agency, an, an autonomous agency, and the RBI opposed it, I'm pretty sure that today they're saying, ouch, <laughs> that was a mistake. We should have not opposed it at that point. We, sh we should have not opposed it and let there be an independent PDMA, because now RBI is going to have a very tough balancing act 
and it doesn't want to allow yields to rise because you know it is the debt manager and government uh, borrowing program is high and there'll be pressure from the market on yields to rise at the same time it has another problem which is that inflation rate is pushing up and uh, if it is an inflation as because it is also an inflation target uh, it has to push you know maybe the at some point or the other if inflation keeps rising and it has to respond by pushing the repo rate up then it is going to be uh, you know in deep trouble right and uh, probably the last question ma'am uh, why government is not borrowing or uh, not taxing the super rich sorry why the, gov- the government is borrowing the question was why the government is not borrowing or taxing the super rich so the government is actually borrowing but probably you could answer the second part of the question and why the government is not taxing the super rich. so the government is at the moment the super rich pay a total of 43% income tax okay i think those who get above uh, is it 10 crore uh, check what that limit is uh, per year they pay uh, or, or, or five crore I, I don't remember the limit I'm way below that so I don't have to worry about it but you know do check and see what that limit is but they pay 43 percent okay if you start charging more uh, money will go out money will money always finds a way to go out the rich themselves will get up and go out okay so whether they go to tax havens and uh, if you look at, uh, historically, if you look at uh, uh, which are the countries from which uh, most capital outflow takes place, like this kind of capital outflow, where which is hidden and which is done through various trade misinvoicing or other capital flight, then this capital flight happens when you try to tax too much. So actually, it can be counterproductive. You can try raising the tax rates. I mean, Indira Gandhi had them up to 97%. Uh, so you, you could raise tax rates to 97% or 100%. You can say that the super rich will get nothing and the government takes it all. But it becomes counterproductive. I think that is a lesson that we've learned from history and other countries. And uh, you lose your tax base if you raise tax rates too much. So I think that that would be the logic of why not to take it beyond 43. I mean, you might well see it go from 43 to 47, but you know, it, I don't think they'll take it back to above 90%, certainly. Okay, ma'am, just a question from me to, to wrap up. Do you see any more Atmanirbhar packages coming in this year also? There were a string of ones what were announced last year, but do you think... This year also, there would be probably a need I mean, for this kind of thing. I mean, perhaps there will be a need for more packages. Let's see how the uh, how things go further. Right. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for uh, joining us. And thank you, everyone, for sending me your questions. I'm sorry I haven't been able to take all your questions. But do please uh, tune into the show even next week. And, uh, you know, we'll keep track of economic recovery together through questions and asking questions. Uh, asking-